And now it's time for our keynote this year, bring to us by Mark. Mark is a Python code developer, your Python so uh, Society Chair, Python Software Foundation Fellow, and the CEO and the founder of Ingenix.com. Today, he will talk about ideas, visions, and reality. Looking back on 20 years of community work, and personally, I'm really looking forward to this particular talk. I really want to hear about his insight into Python community. So please tell us all your experience, Mark. Okay, hi everyone. It's very nice to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's an honor to speak at your conference and giving a keynote. Uh, also, congratulations to your 10 years of PyCon Taiwan. That's an amazing achievement, and uh, I can feel with you. So <laughs> this is uh, really something that uh, is, is very impressive. So thank you for the introduction, Peter. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my experience in community work, uh, looking back on 20 years. Actually, it's more than 20 years now. Um, and I'm going to give you a few insights. I'm going to talk a bit about the projects that I ran and hope that uh, you will enjoy this. If you have any questions, um, I will have my, my Slido on, uh, so perhaps you can just throw them in there. Uh, you can also ask questions uh, during the talk, so we have an hour, so plenty of time. Okay, so speaker introduction, so who am I? Peter already uh, told you quite a bit about myself, so I can probably skip this slide. Um, the most important parts that I'm going to talk about in, in, in this keynote is uh, my role as a Python core developer, the uh, PSF, the Python Society, uh, Python Software Foundation, and of course the EuroPython uh, Society, which I'm currently chairing. Uh, and I also have a company, a consulting company. I'm basically doing business as a consulting CTO or senior solutions architect. And I've been using Python for a very long time. So what are we going to talk about today? This is the agenda. I'm going to give a, a short introduction uh, and then talk about the different communities I was involved in. Uh, I will run through a number of things that I learned along the way. Uh, and then I talk a bit about leadership. So uh, I hope that is interesting for you. On, on the right, you can see our EuroPython team from, from Basel. That was the last in-person conference that we ran uh, in Basel in 2019. And that was an amazing team. Just wanted to highlight this on the slide. So how did I start with Python? Uh, basically, my, my main motivation for Python comes from uh, when, I, when I discovered Python in 1994. Uh, I, I had a look at uh, one of these uh, CDs. At, at those times, you had everything on CDs, so internet was not really that much of a thing yet. Um, there was an operating system called OS2, IBM OS2, and I was uh, very much into that system because it was brand new. It had lots of new features. And there was a, um, a CD, a regular CD was being published every, I think, quarter or so, uh, where a company collected open source software for OS2. And uh, I, I got one of those CDs and then, and then I ran through the language section and on that CD I found Python for the very first time. Uh, and I, I was really excited to, to have a look at that and uh, to, to get into that. I read the, the tutorial, Guido's tutorial, um, in, in the afternoon, and then I immediately started, you know, working with Python and, and using it. At the time, I was a C programmer, so I was, you know, very much appreciating that you could just use data structures like lists or dictionaries from, from you know, right from the start. You didn't have to really program everything yourself. And that was a very, very nice uh, experience and, and really made my day in, in, in write everything in C, and Python made it a lot more easy for me. Plus, I had an advantage. I could interface from C to Python, which was exciting for me as well. By doing that, I could, uh, I could basically do all the high-level things in Python, and then I could do all the low-level things that needed to run fast in C. So that was really what uh, made my day in, in, in those times. And 
that's how I fell in love with Python. That's how I uh, basically started working towards making Python um, grow, making it prosper, making it known everywhere, you know, to have a, a huge following in IT. And uh, I, I think it was, of course, it wasn't only uh, me working on this. It was a lot of people working on this. But, but this was my main motivation to get into Python and start working with it and, and start, uh, you know, looking into the community, everything that was around it. What I very much liked is the elegance of that of the language, and uh, because I, you know, I very much like to write elegant code and uh, code that is clean, that is easy to read, easy to understand, is well structured. Um, I also like working with you know smart people, and at the time, the community was very small, but that very small community had lots of very very smart people, you know people much smarter than, than myself, like Guido, or Tim, or Raymond, to work with all of those people, really inspiring. And there was also a lot of potential for improving the language and improving the language following. So the organizations that started to build around Python and the conference landscape, uh, in those early days, there wasn't really much. So... Uh, a lot could be done, and a lot, a lot was done by, by the various individuals in the community. So that's how I started to then, you know, contribute to Python. Um, I, I first started writing my, my extensions, the, the C extensions for Python, because there were a couple of things that I needed in Python which weren't there at the time. For example, there was no daytime library available for Python at the time, and so I started to write MX Daytime. I also write, wrote a number of other tools that I needed, like an, a database interface or a, a text parsing engine. And I uh, made most of those tools open source. And for example, MX Daytime at the time was basically becoming the standard for daytime processing until uh, Python itself, the standard library, got a daytime module. I also worked on the on the Python core itself. So the the I think the largest contribution I did to, to Python was the Unicode integration that happened in uh, Python 1.6 or 2.0, uh, depending on how you look at it. So early in, in uh, 2000, that landed in Python. And I, I worked on that integration. Um, I basically did all the, the data type uh, modeling, the codex uh, integration that was needed for this um, and then Frederick Lund was working on the regular expression engine, which used this data type. Uh, he was also the main author of, of the original type implementation that I, I built everything on. So I, I took his implementation and adapted it for, for the integration plans that we had. And then I maintained this for over 10 years, I think 10 or 12 years, uh, until other people then took over. I also contributed the platform module that you have in the standard library. That's something I needed for another project. I needed to determine what, what platform you're running on and then based on that, I make certain decisions. Um, because I was very much into getting Python more performant, I wrote this uh, micro benchmark, PyBench it was called, and that landed in the standard library as well for a couple of years. Um, plus I worked on the database API, the Python DB API as you know it, PEP249. Um, and that's a standard that's still in, in use now, so uh, that's something that's basically, you know, lasted for a very long time. So that was my involvement in, in core development, and I also did lots of other smaller things which I don't have on this slide. Um, but that was an amazing experience, and uh, I really very much appreciated working uh, as a core developer. Then the, the Python Software Foundation was founded in 2001. And the uh, the PSF the PSF was um, s sorry uh, Peter can can you turn off the noise there there's a background noise I'm constantly hearing someone talking <laughs> thanks um, right the the PSF was founded in 2001 it was founded at a conference the the IPC nine uh, it was that was held in Los Angeles in the US at the time. And um, basically the, the purpose of the PSF was to 
make sure that that Python has a, a, a strong backup association there that holds the trademarks, the copyright, and so on for Python, and that's why why the mostly the core developers at the time founded the PSF. The PSF membership was very small at that time, um, and something that I would I wanted to to achieve was to grow the PSF to to have uh, the PSF have more members. Unfortunately, the the model that was chosen for the PSF was the basically the Apache Software Foundation model of membership. So. Um, if you wanted to get new members in, then always the, the members always had to vote uh, once a year on, on you know, getting new members into the uh, PSF. And that was a very, um, you know, it, it took ages to, to scale up the PSF. It, it, it was very, um, uh, let's say, not to, it, it didn't really feel right that, that people had to vote on other people who they did not really know anything about. So that model didn't really work out. And then uh, over time, this problem became more and more apparent. And then uh, finally, I think it was in, in 2014 or something around there, uh, the model, the membership model was changed. And so nowadays, everyone can just become a member and they can you know, self-determine um, uh, self themselves as a managing member or contributing member and then get voting rights in the PSF. So the model nowadays is much, much better than in those days. But that was one of the, the main things that I wanted to achieve. And so I basically, and on, at every conference I went, I always tried to, to make some noise for the PSF to get people in to um, tell people about what the PSF did. Uh, I also created marketing material for the PSF, like stickers, for example. I created conference kits, which uh, people could take to conferences to present the PSF. What you see on the lower right here, this blue thing, uh, this is... Uh, basically the background that was used for the for the conference kits. Um, I started to work on a Python brochure. That was a, a, a very, you know, it started as a small project, but then eventually became a very big project. So we created the, the very first uh, brochure for Python uh, to, to give out to people, especially to high-level management, to, to get more awareness for Python in higher level management. Because at the time, uh, Python wasn't very known. And so every time you went to a customer, for example, and told them about, okay, I'm gonna write this in Python, I'm gonna use Python to implement your, your solution. They always ask, uh, what is Python? I've never heard of Python. And, and is, is that can trust? Is it something that we can build on? And so there, it was difficult to, to always basically answer the same things. And so the idea with the Python brochure was you, you give them the Python brochure and they can then look at where Python was being used, for example, at CERN or by NASA or in the industry or in finance. Uh, there were already lots of companies using it internally, but not really making a lot of noise about it. So people did not really know. And that was the, the uh, purpose of the, the Python brochure. Um, I also... You know, worked on lots of other projects like the job board. I restarted with a, a small team. Um, I started this events calendar project, <clears throat> which is still ongoing, where we collect all the events happening uh, around Python and we put it on the website. Um, I work on the trademarks committee, and one of I'm one of the uh, trademark committee chairs, together with uh, David Mertz. Um, and I also maintain the Python wiki, meaning maintaining in that case to keep it running, which isn't uh, that easy nowadays. And a couple of other things. Uh, so that's basically what I did in, in the PSF. And uh, the reason I'm telling you all this is I want to give you an idea of, uh, you know, how the, the, all the different perspectives uh, that I, um, and as part of these projects that I, I had in the Python community. So... For example, here on the PSF, I was working on lots of these projects, but I was always also on the board and sometimes deciding on these things and sometimes trying to push these things forward. And I also learned how difficult it is sometimes to make other people understand that a project is worthwhile doing. And that's something I'm going to get into um, after this, this introduction overview. Then in 2002, uh, we had the first EuroPython conference. Uh, I was one of the, the, the people in the, um, 
the fairly large crowd at that time who, who wanted to have a Europe, European Python conference because at the time, most of the conferences, well, actually, there, there was only one conference at the time, which was the, the, it was called IPC, International Python Conference. It was a commercially organized conference in the U.S. And um, the, uh, be, because all the conferences always happened in the U.S., you always had to fly to the U.S. to attend the conference. It was very expensive for, for everyone to, to do that. And we wanted to get a bit, uh, you know, more following in, the, in, in Europe. And so the idea was that we start a, a larger European Python conference. And that's what EuroPython came to be. At the time, ZOAP was very big, so there was uh, also a lot of following for ZOAP. And uh, that's why the, the first conference actually was called European Python and ZOAP Conference. And it was organized in Charleroi in Belgium, a very nice city. And uh, there were lots of discussion around this. There were lots of opinions. We had lots of fights. There were lots of you know, strong egos. Um, we had lots of small companies, and all the companies were struggling to find customers and find projects. Uh, but there was also a lot of passion. So it was, uh, those were really exciting times. Sometimes the, the, but at the end of the day, we, we then finally made it happen with a small executive team because at, at some point we found that, you know, having all of these discussions and discussing every single detail on mailing lists about a conference simply will not get us to a conference, right? So at one point, um, uh, the, Basically, a, a team of three people formed. I was one of those people. And uh, then we basically took the ideas that we had collected in all these discussions and then actually made them happen to organize the conference in Charleroi. And it was a, um, wasn't it a huge conference. We had 240 people there. But we had all the, the major people there, like Guido was there, Eric Raymond was there. Uh, lots of you know, other core developers were there. Uh, people actually flew over from the U.S. to attend the conference, so uh, we had lots of people from Europe, of course. It was it was a lot of fun, uh, and it was you know really exciting to to be there and and to you know have this this first conference in Europe happen. So that was actually the first major community community run conference for Python because the IPCs before that were commercially organized and and PyCon US, which uh, uh, was also community run, uh, started in 2003. So then the EuroPython conference uh, took on and we you know, wanted to do that every year. So after a while, uh, people thought that uh, we also needed some kind of society, some kind of organization behind that. And so uh, that's how the EuroPython society was founded. It was founded in 2004 initially basically just to protect the IP rights and the trademarks, similar to the PSF. Um, and the, the main purpose of the society in those times was to basically select the next venue or select the next location and team to run the conference. Because at the time, the, the way that the conference was run was going to um, uh, basically approaching different teams or having teams approach the, the EPS and then propose to, to run the conference um, in a certain place. And in those days, we typically had the conference happen for two years in a row in each place so that the, um, basically everything that people learned in the first year could be reused in the second year so that we, don't, we didn't have that much uh, loss of, of institutional knowledge between the different years and it was a bit easier for the teams to, to run. The EPS itself basically just took care of the selection. It didn't really... Um, do much in terms of the running the conference, that was done by the local team. And the local team in those times also took care of all the financial risk, which was manageable in those times. Um, nowadays, it, it isn't anymore. So what, what then happened is the as the EuroPython conference grew, um, and it became apparent that local teams would not take on all these financial risks anymore, uh, we then had to basically restart the EPS in a different mode. So uh, that was done in 2012. In 2012, the, the EPS was basically reformed. Uh, we had a new board uh, elected. 
and uh, the, the EPS then actually started to work on Europython itself. First, we, we started with a, just having the board and a local team run the conference. Uh, and then later on, we Im implemented something called the Europython workgroup. So we had different workgroups for different tasks. And we moved more and more of the organization away from the local team and into those workgroups, which had the, the nice benefit that we weren't losing all that institutional knowledge every time we switched a location. We initially had the workgroups plus the local team. So the local team would organize everything that is um, local at the, uh, that had to be done locally at the uh, conference place. Um, but then in 2017, we found that it's actually, we can actually do without the local team. So we, we could turn fully remote, which again was something that was new to us. Um, but it was, it was working out really well. And we found that it's, we don't need the local team anymore. We don't need people on the ground to help us. If we have a good conference venue to work with and a good team to work with, then um, this is you know, not needed anymore. So we could turn fully remote, which of course made a big difference because then we could uh, more easily get people in and to help. Also, we took on the full financial risk uh, after 2017 uh, which was needed because uh, you know we are running Europython at a at a scale of around six hundred thousand euros um, per edition, and that's a you know it's a huge number. It's if it's not something that a, a small company or or you know private um, people would want to to risk. So that's something that we had to do, uh, and that's what we've uh, done in the last few years. We've we've built up a, a budget for disaster recovery. <clears throat> of around the same amount. So now we are in a position that we have around 600,000 euros in the bank so that we can actually run a complete conference just out of, out of pocket. And, and that's something that's, that's needed because you never know. I mean, something like COVID could, could you know, hit us again and there could be other reasons for, for the conference not happening or, or other things that could get in our way basically you know have the conference fail for a year and so we could potentially lose uh, quite a lot of money and with this buffer that we have we are now able to to actually run the conference even in, in if something like that happens it, it wouldn't mean the end of your presence so that's a very good um, achievement that we have there we also started to extend our mission so that we not only run the conference anymore but we also support Python Europe so um, if there is a, uh, let's say, another uh, Python conference running in Europe or uh, someone wants to do a project in Europe uh, that has to do with, with Python, then we can help financially. We have a grants program for that. So that's also something that we um, set up in the last couple of years, and that's running well. And, of course, you know, uh, <laughs> I couldn't just let it end there, so I had to do something in my hometown, Düsseldorf, as well. Um, I started uh, what we call the Python Meeting Düsseldorf, which is a user group meeting that we run every quarter. Uh, it ha it's a completely different scale to compare to all these conferences and organizations. Uh, it's, we just have like 10 or 25 people per meeting. Uh, we have many people who regularly come to that meeting. It's a lot less formal than all these other communities. It's a lot of fun. It's, uh, I just you know, enjoy this very much. And uh, it's something that you know, complements all these other communities. Let me just check whether there are any questions. No, I don't see any questions. Um, and let's move on. So those were the, the communities I wanted to, to talk about. And this is an overview of those 20 years, or actually it's... Uh, it's, it's more than 20 years that uh, I've been active in, in the Python community now. Um, I worked as a core developer, so I have a perspective on core development. I, I basically was a founding fellow of the Python Software Foundation, I still am a fellow. I was board member of the PSF for quite a few years. Um, I was on the executive committee that started EuroPython. I was board member for a very long time. I'm going to uh, basically stop being a board member uh, this year, actually next week when the General Assembly of the Europython Society will happen. <clears throat> uh, 
and then uh, you know focus on on new projects. And I, I started this user group meeting in 2012, and it's still ongoing. So quite a bit of stuff, um, and I learned a lot of lessons in those times. And that's basically the the main theme of this this talk. So it's not a, so much about you know boasting about. Uh, Things that I did is more about giving you an idea of what you will, what you may, let's say, run into issues that you may run into. What you can do to to um, address them and to still feel comfortable uh, working in open source and working in in the community. Um, I hope this will help uh, you know someone. Uh, I collected these things and added some some notes and some. Uh, insights that I gained over the years uh, to these slides so that potentially you have, you can, you know, take something away from the talk that is useful for you. Um, I'm also going to make the slides available. There's a lot of text on these slides, which is intentional. It's not, I'm, I don't want to, you know, read out everything. It's the purpose is that you can take those slides and then you can uh, perhaps have a look and maybe ask some questions later on. So the, the first big uh, thing that you will run I work in open source and, and uh, these communities when you run a project is time management. Uh, of course, you have to balance the time that you invest into a project or you invest into a community or invest into core development with your your real life, you know, your you know life outside open source and outside these communities. And that sometimes is a bit difficult because uh, you you tend to get dragged into these communities and into the into the projects, and then you know. Uh, forget about the the life outside, which of course you know pays your pays your rent, and so um, you have to be careful about that, and you have to do proper time management. Something else I found, which I found a bit um, strange, is that you very often have to actually fight for being able to do good things. So, for example. It was extremely hard for me to convince people to put money into this Python brochure project. Um, that took, I think, a year or two to uh, actually convince people in the PSF board that this is a good thing. Um, there were lots of arguments flying around. Uh, you know, people had different perspectives on this, different. Um, uh, you know, didn't want to invest into something that is printed and then sent around to people. Uh, they they thought that everything should be on on you know just PDFs and you just send emails and maybe do a web page something like that. Um, the the whole concept of doing marketing for Python was something that was for for many people it seemed very strange. So many people thought that Python would basically just you know be successful on its own by itself. Uh, which, of course, isn't necessarily the case because if you want to get into different, uh, let's say, management levels, especially the higher ones, the the these higher level management uh, people, they they simply won't go to a website and educate themselves. You have to give them something that they can take on a plane or maybe a train or in a car and read. And they also want to show it to other people, and uh, so you need something that you can that's tangible, that you can actually take into your hand, that feels like quality, that feels like it's uh, something that's worth spending your time on, and and that was the the argument I always try to then put forward, but I didn't really, you know, um, get much uh, much support there. That's just one example. There were there are many other examples. So typically, what you find is that you have to do or enter endless discussions with people to, to actually make make things happen to to be able to put your time into one of these projects. Sometimes you have to fight strong egos. Sometimes you have to fight against people's own agendas, so they have you know different things that they want to prioritize. Uh, sometimes it's just different values, it's cultural differences. So people in the U.S. think differently than people in Europe and. Th I'm pretty sure that people in Asia also have different perspectives and values than, than people in Europe and in the US. So it's something that you have to address, you have to consider because most of these organizations are international nowadays. And so 
you, when you enter one of these discussions, you have to be aware that you're going to get a lot of uh, questions. You're going to have to address a lot of different uh, perspectives. And some of these perspectives may also be surprising for you because, you know, for, for you, it's something that's very natural. It, but if you speak to someone, let's say, from the U.S. or maybe from, from Asia or from, from Africa, then uh, the, what, what you think is, is very natural may not necessarily be very natural for them. And so you have to try to convince them. But you shouldn't, you know, basically put let this put you off. It's just something that you have to be aware of when you start, so that you can address this and and you you find that um, that you can convince people over time. Something else that you have to consider is motivation. So you do need to motivate yourself. There's you, you when when doing something like this, there you, you typically don't get a lot of recognition for for what you're doing. So you have to find your energy energy source for whatever you're doing, um, basically within yourself, which is what I call fusion reactor here. So it could be that, that you really you, you know you love Python, you want to make everyone aware of Python, you want to have it grow. It could be that you love working together with other people. Could also be some other goal that you have that you want to, uh, you know, have Python being used. Let's say I don't know in in a certain community for a certain purpose, or you want to run a certain kind of event. <clears throat> you have to find this energy source, and and that needs to keep you running. You cannot rely on other people giving you recognition and using that as as uh, an energy source. Um, also. Don't expect to to you know to make lots of money on these things. Uh, typically, that doesn't happen. Uh, the probably the the only thing that you will get in terms of you know monetary advantage is that more people will know you, and so sometimes people will approach you when they have certain questions, maybe also in a in a commercial setting. The next big thing that you have to be aware of is. You have to be. You have to have endurance. You have to be very, you know, sturdy. Very. Um, you have to stick to your your ideas, your your project, um, even if if things you know get very boring at times. Uh, even if there's little input from other people, you just have to keep going. That's something that's that's very very important. Otherwise. Again, because you don't get a lot of uh, attention or a lot of recognition or from other people, uh, you might just, you know, stop along the way and not, not get your project um, out to, to the community. That's something that's, it's, it's hard. Um, it sometimes, you know, can make you feel uh, very, you know, depressed or uh, you, you feel basically you're just working on your own. Um, but it's, it's something that, you still have to keep going. And if you, for example, if you need help, then the best way to, to get help from other people is to directly approach those people that you want to get help from. So this, for example, the idea that you just ask for help uh, in a forum, let's say in a mailing list or so, and then and then expect someone to, to come back to you, um, this is not necessarily going to fly. So I, I always found that it's the, the, the best approach to to basically make contact with people who who really want to, um, who, who really can help you, who really have the motivation to help you, is to basically directly approach them, talk to them about your idea, and then get them excited about the idea. Um, this kind of like blanket request out to the community to get help usually doesn't work that well. Or you get... Uh, people coming back to you and then they, they come back with questions like, oh, uh, how much time do I have to invest? Uh, um, you know, what's the, what's the recognition that I will get from this? Uh, is it going to be a big project, a small one? You get lots of questions and then you invest a lot of time into these discussions and at the end of the day, those people will not, not always help you enough to, to actually um, make your project a success. Something else to consider is uh, when you know when things simply get unbearable because either you don't get enough following or uh, you have too many complaints from people about whatever you're doing. It's it's a good idea to just stop doing it. 
right? So don't be afraid to just uh, leave one of these open source projects or leave a community. Um, that's certainly something that you can do. After all, it's just volunteer time, right? It's your volunteer time as well. So if people don't appreciate your work, you can just do something else. Yeah, I really talked a lot about recognition. Uh, so this slide, I think I've already covered. Um, the important part here on this slide is that if you don't get recognition or if, if you uh, don't receive not enough feedback on, on the work that you're doing, then it's usually best to reward yourself. So whenever you've reached a goal, let's say, I don't know, you've, you've organized a conference and the conference is running very nicely, like, for example, PyCon Taiwan is running very nicely here in this uh, virtual setting. After the conference, you can just, you can sit back, you can, you can feel good about it that you've organized this conference uh, and that you made a lot of people happy uh, and you can just do something for, for yourself. Let's say you go on a nice, I don't know, holiday, or maybe you buy a new notebook, or you do something that you've always wanted to do but never, you know, found time for. Then uh, do this and, and, you know, reward yourself. That's actually, it's, it's in, for me, it's always the best way to, to uh, keep going and to, you know, get enough energy for the, for the next round. In case you do get recognition, um, then you should use that. You should use it as an energy energy source. You should use it on your CV, on LinkedIn, a blog, whatever you uh, have for for you know advertising yourself, so that you can use it for getting more attention. Um, typically, there isn't a lot of recognition, so whatever you can get, you should use it, and uh, this will you know make your day as well. There are also some. Some negative aspects to working in, in open source and or working in the open in general. First of all, not everyone will like your ideas, right? So um, nowadays with the, with the size of the community, <clears throat> it is pretty certain that there will be more than just a few people who don't like whatever you want to suggest. You can see that if you go to the Python ideas mailing list, for example, the Python ideas mailing list uh, started out to, to basically be a mailing list for people to, you know, introduce new ideas for Python, um, discuss them. Move. Um, originally that kind of worked, but nowadays most of the time what happens is someone posts an idea and then, you know, you, you find like 10 people who don't like that idea and basically the idea gets, ideas get shut down. Um, and it's not a very nice thing. It's, um, you know, sometimes it, it is, it's, um, it's necessary because the ideas are, you know, they won't bring Python forward. But still, for the people who, who you know, come to the mailing list and then uh, suggest a new idea and want to have that implemented, for them it's frustrating. Uh, they probably do this, you know, maybe two or three times and then they just stop. The thing is that you, you shouldn't really be dependent too much on having your idea implemented in a large kind of, you know, scale. Let's say, you know, get something into the Python standard library or maybe get something into the Python language definition. Um, instead, what you should do is you should just consider implementing your ideas on your own. And uh, while this may seem a bit difficult at first, it's actually nowadays, it's not that difficult anymore because there are so many people in the Python community. You can, you can find, easily find people who basically partner with you or want to partner with you to implement those ideas. And then you can put a project, let's say, on PyPI, Python index, um, and then have it flourish like that. You, you don't necessarily have to have everything in, in Python core. And this is something that, that many people, you know, don't consider or don't want to consider because they want to have their idea in the Python core. And um, I'm just taking this Python ideas list as an example here. It, it, the same applies to other projects or other communities. It very often makes sense to just, you know, do something outside the community or outside the, the uh, project that you're working in. And then maybe when it's successful, come back. Another thing that you can do, of course, is if you don't want to do something outside, you can just put the ideas on hold and then maybe wait a year or two. 
because it it often happens in Python, uh, in, in Python core development especially, that your perspectives change. You know, for example, Guido, or at the time that when, when Guido was the BDFL, uh, Guido would have one opinion, let's say, in one year, and then like five years after, he would basically look at the same idea again and then find, hmm, it's not such a bad idea after all, and then accept the idea, right? That has happened a lot. Also, I mean, to me, uh, it has happened to, to other people. Um, people change their perspectives over time, right? They get have different um, different goals, different um, priorities, and so that makes makes things possible. If you're working in an organization and, and you want to get a project through, then another strategy would be to just wait for people to change. Let's say a new board gets selected, and then you have different people on the board, and then you can basically approach the board again and you know, maybe you have a better uh, perspective on getting your ideas through. So that's something that you can do against pushbacks. Then, uh, well, it's kind of sad, but this does happen. You have to deal with attacks. People who, um, you know, just love doing something against you. Uh, it's not always clear why. Sometimes people just, you know, like to to make uh, feel other people, you know, frustrated, um, who, who sometimes they even have bad intentions. Sometimes it's just you know their own arrogance or ignorance. Um, it always hurts. It's it's always something that uh, is you know many people take personally. I I can just recommend to not take these things personally. Uh, it's also usually a good idea to either ignore the attacks that are coming in or to simply react very, very slowly to those attacks. Because my experience with, with these attacks is, and especially with the attackers themselves, is that um, they simply lose interest after a while. So if you just steadily keep on going with whatever you're doing, um, the attackers will just go away and then, you know, not be interested in attacking you again. Or maybe they come back after a while, but uh, in that period you have your peace of mind and you can continue doing what you what you want to do. So it's it's very important to first not take it personally and second to you know try to uh, deal with these things um, in an open way. Uh, for example, you can talk to other people about these attacks and then basically get their perspective on the attack. This reduces stress because you don't have to take on all the load anymore and you also learn new perspectives. Maybe there's something that that you've done or maybe is your project is moving in a direction uh, that that you know makes people trigger on 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 uh, certain things, certain aspects and uh, then you, when you talk to other people, you can learn these perspectives and then maybe you can change your, your, um, your approach or your perspectives or your project in a slight way and then you can reduce the attack surface. Okay, let's check the questions. Ooh, lots of questions. Um, Peter, are you going to read them out or... Uh, Uh, we uh, just do those at the end. Uh, sorry, is it echo here? Okay. Uh, oh, no, uh, I read a question for you. Uh, we have first question is, what's your experience of running communities for such a long time? Community members come and go. How does the whole community keep going? That's a very good question. So the... Um, what what I call churn is basically people leaving the the communities and then uh, you know new people entering. This is something that all the communities have to have to address, uh, especially if you have long running projects or long running communities like the PSF, for example, had that issue. The PSF uh, used to vote in board members uh, every single year. And often enough, the board members, the, the, the board changed too much so that too many board members left, too many new people came in. 
so that the, the first few months were just spent on educating those new members on what the, the PSF board actually does and how everything works. And that was uh, considered to, to not really scale very well. So what, what's happening now is that the, the board members are voted in for, I think it's three years. And then um, we only have a number of seats in the board which get reelected so that you don't have to churn in that much. So that's one idea. For EuroPython, it basically, for the EuroPython Society, it, it does actually work uh, quite well with voting in new boards every year because we have lots less churn. There are, you know, not that many people going in and out. And we do have the work groups, which are basically kept from year to year. So they don't change that much either. And uh, onboarding people uh, is, is a lot easier that way. Okay. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question is, what's you, what will you suggest for maintaining for open source code? You mean uh, how, to, how to approach the um, you know, maintenance part of, of open source? So let's say you have, you've uh, created a project and then of course people will start using the project and then will expect you to maintain it forever. <laughs> Ideally that's what what users will typically want from you. Um, of course, you all, sometimes you know you just you know move to other projects, and so it doesn't really um, you, you don't have that much energy. In 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 that case, what you can do is uh, you can just you know put your project up on GitHub, and then you can you can ask for someone else to take over. Um, because you know it, it's not necessarily so that you are still interested in your project. If you are still interested, of course, you can keep going as long as you like, and, and you can try to get more people interested in maintaining it and get more help, and, and that will then basically uh, make the project go on for quite a long time. That's what's happening with lots of very popular projects. So basically, the initial developers, they then you know phase out their contributions, and new people come in, and, and they grow into the maintenance, uh, maintenance position and then can take care of that project uh, going onwards. Okay, next one. Okay, so next question is, how you ever consider devoting your passion to other promising programming language communities, <laughs> such as Rust and right. why? Very good question, yes. So, um, I, like I said in the beginning, I was a C programmer, and I very much liked C programming, And uh, but then, you know, Python basically made everything much easier. Nowadays, uh, there are new languages like Rust, for example, which would be an alternative to C. Um, I've had a look at, at Rust, uh, but I've, I've not really had time so far to, to really look into it deeply and, and to, um, to look at that uh, language in, you know, closer. I also basically had a, uh, you know, try to, to learn Go, uh, which would be another alternative. Um, but all, again, I, I didn't really have enough time for, for working on that. So that's something that, unfortunately, because you know I'm spending lots of time on commercial projects nowadays and, and managing teams and working as CTO and so on, so I don't have a lot of time to invest into those things anymore. Um, so I did consider it, but um, <laughs> so far I've, I've not really had time to look into this. Maybe in the, in, you know, in the coming years, who knows? Yeah. Okay. So maybe I can. Energy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so please. maybe we can just continue the uh, the slides now, and then we can have the other questions later on. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Director, please. Uh, Mark, want to? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. So I can continue. So some thoughts on leadership. Um, Leadership is something that you normally don't, you know, think about when getting into these things like open source or communities. But um, sooner or later, depending on what you're doing or how much following your your project gets or your uh, whatever you uh, work on as a community member, you find yourself in a leadership role. And even though if you you know you may not really want to be a leadership role, you simply have to deal with it and you have to take uh, care of your team and then start working in a team and and make them feel comfortable and, uh, you know, do something together that actually makes sense, uh, is enjoyable for everyone and, and gets you to the goal that you have. So this is something that you, you have to consider uh, as well. 
Now, the, the bad news is that leadership in, in OSS and communities um, can actually be very hard. The, the main obstacle that you, you have in, uh, compared to a commercial setting is that delegating work doesn't work reliably in OSS or community work. The, the problem is that people can, sim- because of they're all volunteers like yourself, right? They can simply walk away. They can not deliver on time. Uh, and, and that makes things very difficult if, you, if you're actually planning for a certain deadline, let's say, or you're planning for a milestone. Um, this is something that you always have to keep in mind when, when you know, leading a team. Um, you have to take the, the possibility of people not actually getting stuff done into uh, perspective. Of course, this happens in commercial settings as well, but there if you have other ways of uh, getting people to do <clears throat> what they're supposed to do, this doesn't work in OSS. Something else that uh, I... To, if you're applying a bit of control, then that is always uh, or often con- considered as distrust, which of course isn't true. I mean, it's not like you're not trusting that person. It's just that you want to know where things currently are so that you can actually then address that and then manage the project in a way that still... Uh, and the second thing is authority. Uh, people have to accept you as the as the leader, right? So you have to have some kind of authority. Authority, especially in open source and communities, is, is uh, often questioned, and that makes things hard as well. Uh, there's an easy way around this. You can just do consensus build. But uh, you will, of course, have a you know have issues that where, where you cannot reach consensus, and so consensus uh, building will not get you to to your goal. And so you have to be considerate of all these things. If you are, uh, then you can still make it happen. You also have to. Be careful that everyone is aware of the expectations and uh, everyone is aware of the working environment that you want to use for, for implementing your leadership or implementing your team. So it's, it's important to discuss with your peers about what kind of management you want to use, what kinds of assumptions you, you make and they make. Uh, and you know, especially in terms of authority, it's, it's important to document the various roles and responsibilities so that everyone is on the same page. Because otherwise, if you do things, if you do too many things implicit, then uh, this will cause conflict sooner or later. And something that's very important for time critical situations, because you have this issue that you cannot really, you know, delegate work in a, in a reliable way, you, s- you have to sometimes, as a leader, you have to sometimes override responsibilities that others in your team have simply because you have to make sure that certain things are done uh, by a certain deadline. This is, for example, in, in conference organization, this is very, very important because in, in, when, when you run a large conference, there are so many other people relying on your decisions uh, that you simply you cannot miss the deadlines. You have to stick to the deadlines. You have to make sure, for example, that your, let's say uh, something simple, your badges are printed, right? So that you can give out badges at the conference. Or you have to make sure that the graphics are delivered to the conference venue so that they can start you know, preparing everything, printing your, your banners and so on. Or you have to order certain gadgets uh, from, let's say, I don't know, Amazon or uh, some other service so that you, you have all the, all the office supplies uh, at the conference. There are lots of these small things. Or let's say you want to open your, your website, the ticket shop. You have to make sure that the, the ticket shop is com- properly set up and, and you can actually launch the ticket sales. It's work, so you have to you know, go and test it. Um, there are lots of these small things, and, and sometimes people who are who should be in charge of these things are not necessarily doing things um, in a way that allows you to meet those deadlines. And so in those cases, you need to override, which is something that you would normally um, not do, but in those cases, it's necessary. And you have to do it as long as you clearly communicate this, I, this should be fine. Then 
you have to do a reality check, right? So basically there's life outside of OSS. So you have to plan for delays. You have to have a backup plan for everything. You have to be aware that we are all humans, right? We make mistakes. We use the wrong words and we are sometimes stressed. So you shouldn't take uh, things as an offense. You, instead, you should try to just calm things down a bit. And you have to do the same with, the, with communications. You have to set the expectations right. You have to tell other people about how you communicate. There are some people who prefer the very direct way of communicating. There are other people who, who want to have everything wrapped in nice words. Um, those two groups, they don't go well together, right? So you have to make sure that everyone in your team knows, let's, for example, how you communicate, and you have to know how everyone else communicates so that there's, you can avoid misunderstandings. Um, there's something with text communication that people sometimes forget is that it's very low bandwidth, so it's hard to express your opinions. If something you know, starts to go wrong, you should seek med mediation for this and you know, ask other people to maybe help. You have to motivate people as a leader, right? You have to set a good working example of, of working hard and you have to try to delegate as much work as you can to other people because they want to feel needed, right? And you have to share the knowledge that you have so that they can do this. You have to say thank you more, more, than, more often than uh, you probably think. Um, this is the way that people in a team get recognition, right? And even if you don't hear a lot of thank yous and you don't get a lot of recognition for, for your team, it's really, really necessary. And you have to show pride and passion because that's what drives other people as well. And then at the end of the day, at, at some point in your project or community work, you want to exit, right? And so you have to plan for the exit. And um, that needs some time. You need to find a good time to leave. You need to prepare the exit, find a new project, and then move on. So, you know, I talked about lots of, you know, maybe negative things, but I just want to make you aware of these things so that you can better plan for them and then you have a, a good solution. So the main takeaways here are, if I uh, still can finish the slide, Peter, <laughs> the main takeaways are... Um, yes. Yes, okay. So you, you need to make sure that you enjoy what you're doing. I mean, that's the main driver that you have. You need to reward yourself. You, you should take breaks when needed. Um, sometimes things take longer, that's okay. And when you, need a, when you need to lead a team, you should manage the expectations, always have a backup plan so that you, you can meet your deadlines, and you need to show your inspiration so that things can uh, actually work out for everyone. So that's all I had. And uh, yeah, this slide is my, my last slide. So never stop to learn, always try out new things. And these are very exciting times. So there's, even though Python is already very big, it's going to get huge in the next couple of years. And so there's, there's lots of stuff that you can do, lots of things that you can get into, lots of communities you can enter, or you can start yourself. So please do. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mark. And very gorgeous talk. And maybe we still have time to answer one or two questions. Um, so first question is, uh, how do you motivate yourself? It's difficult for something. Uh, sometimes to need to convince people to do uh, good things instead of just start caring and walk away. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a very good question. So <laughs> typically, my motivator for for uh, projects is I, I'm, I'm a very stubborn person. So if I think something is good for Python, something is good for communities, then I really try to push that idea. And then that's my driver. And uh, because I really like Python, I, I then try to convince other people that this is something that needs to be done. It's good. And, and that's uh, how I, I keep going. For other people, it's, um, this is indeed a, um, something that you have to ask yourself. How are you going to motivate yourself if too many people will push you back? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It's like I said, you can try outside the community or you can do something on your own first and then come back to the other people and maybe convince them that way. Yeah, and we have uh, still have some questions unanswered, but we are running out of time. So the session, uh, the session comes to an end, and thank you for all your listening.